Hey everybody, welcome to Dream Seed VR. I'm your host Sarah Finn, and today's episode is a special analysis of Blade Runner. So for those of you who are on the West Coast, you have no doubt noticed over the past few weeks that we have been inundated with a lot of smoke. And throughout the internet, there have been a lot of memes regarding this, drawing comparisons to Ridley Scott's film Blade Runner, as well as the new Blade Runner. So inspired by that, I figured it was a good excuse as any to talk your ear off about my favorite book and my favorite movie. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, Blade Runner is actually based on a novel by Philip K. Dick entitled Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? This book came out in 1968 and contrast to the film which takes place in Los Angeles, California, the book takes place in San Francisco. So for the sake of drawing comparisons between the reality and the book, uh, we're going to point out that San Francisco looked very much like the book these past couple weeks. So, spoilers ahead for anybody who hasn't read the book or seen the film. I'm definitely going to talk in depth about some of the themes as well as uh, plot points. So if you want to spare yourself those spoilers, skip this video until maybe after you've seen it. And then uh, we can jump in together. How do I even start? This book has had an enormous influence on my life. I sincerely would not be here talking with you now had it not been for me reading this book at 15 years old. Um, when I read it, it had a, a huge impact on my perception of emotions, of, about what it means to be human, about the nature of empathy, the nature of evolution in the human species, and where it is our society is going. The focus of Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep revolves around a guy named Rick Deckard. And Rick Deckard is sort of like a cop, sort of like a bounty hunter, but it's his job to retire androids. Androids that are actually illegal to be on Earth that are used essentially as slave labor in off-world colonies. Now, the preface for this book is a World War III, basically, called World War Terminus. The fallout from this war causes an ecological collapse that kills most of the animal life on the planet. Because of this, there is a huge hole in the heart of humanity, and lots of people resort to uh, having exotic pets, and pets of all kinds, as a means of filling that hole in their heart where nature used to be. Lots of people order their pets from a catalog called Sydney's, and the whole reason the book is called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep is because at the beginning of the story, Rick Deckard loses his sheep named Oscar. Oscar passes away after accidentally ingesting a piece of hay bale, which gave him tetanus and killed him. And because of this loss, Rick Deckard feels a huge hole in his heart, and he wants to get another pet as a means of fostering that sense of empathy. Because animals are extremely expensive, uh, he decides that he's going to take on a few more jobs. And when I say jobs, I mean retiring androids. And when I say retiring androids, basically means killing artificial life forms, killing androids. So Rick Deckard is essentially forced to put aside his empathy and what he feels like is potentially his humanity in order to retire a few more of these beings so he can afford a real sheep. In the meantime, because it's socially embarrassing to not have an animal or to have his neighbors find out that Oscar has passed away, he decides that he is going to get an artificial sheep to sort of replace Oscar so his neighbors don't find out that Oscar has passed away. This is strange for numerous reasons on an emotional level, but it also is the driving force behind the title. And the question essentially means, would an android want an electric sheep so we could empathize with this being being artificial? Would an android want an electric sheep to match its electric nature? Spoiler alert, at the end of the story we learn that no, androids likely do not dream of electric sheep. There's a scene in which the android Pris is hanging out in an abandoned building at the edge of the city, 
and she is slowly pulling a tiny spider apart. One of the things that we are cued into in the world of, of the book earlier on is that there aren't really any real bugs left. And so this tiny spider is no doubt electric in nature. And you know, whether or not Pris knows this, we have no idea. But for the fact that she doesn't care, and it could be electric or not, uh, she's still pulling it apart, and she has no empathy for it. Earlier in the book, there is a lot of internal monologue with Rick Deckard exploring the nature of empathy in human evolution. In particular, picking apart the idea of whether or not predator animals can afford empathy in the wild when they need to hunt their prey. If the wolf empathizes with its prey, it might choose not to eat it, might choose not to hunt, and that would impact its ability to survive. And so he's postulating whether or not humans have been given the opportunity to develop altruism and empathy because of our uh, technological nature, our ability to abstract and, and build things that help us circumvent that need to hunt directly. So one of the reasons why I wanted to explore this book and film a little bit more in depth for you is because ever since I first read it nearly 20 years ago, I had been deeply moved by the themes as well as the stark tone in which it's written. Philip K. Dick's work has been instrumental in science fiction for the past 50 years or so. <clears throat> Its influence is broad and very deep. It's impacted the imagination of filmmakers and video game makers, new science fiction authors and artists alike. In general, the themes that he talks about transcend just science fiction. His work is less about the technologies and more about how they impact society and people. Blade Runner is particularly important because it really picks apart what it means on a psychological level to be human and whether or not artificial beings are capable of emulating those same qualities and if emulation equals equality, really. If an android can act like it has feelings, does that mean it actually has feelings? In the book that's explored with a test that Rick Deckard uh, implements on various androids, different models of them, from Tyrell Corporation. Uh, the test is called the voight kampf test and it goes through different hypothetical situations and asks the androids how they feel about the circumstances and what they would choose to do. Uh, the test not only monitors their uh, their blood rate, their pupillary dilation, their breathing, all these subtle physiological responses, but it also uh, takes into consideration the answers that the androids give. Overall, the test is administered by the Blade Runner, but it's also determined by the Blade Runner whether or not that android has passed or failed the test. One of the unique aspects about Rachel's character, and if you're familiar with it, Rachel is the niece of Tyrell, the head of Tyrell Corporation. Rachel has implanted memories and initially she doesn't know that she's an android. She has implanted memories that she is Tyrell's niece and that she grew up on a sort of like a like a spaceship, a space freighter out in the solar system and that she only grew up with a crew of you know maybe 10 people or so. Now remember this is the book I'm referring to. It's different in the movie. But the reason why it's significant in the book is because with that few people around her, for her to socialize with and develop rapport and understand social norms, Rachel sort of comes across like somebody with sociopathy, somebody who has an underdeveloped emotional intelligence, someone who doesn't understand the right responses to social cues and has an inability to read emotions on a person's face. Because of this personal history that's been endowed to Rachel with these artificial memories, there's sort of a buffer, sort of like a social history that gives her a plausible deniability when it comes to her being an android. 
Also, because she doesn't know, she takes these artificial memories for fact. When the truth is, is that she's an artificial being. She's a Nexus 6. She's one of the latest models from Tyrell Corporation. And she is essentially a prototype using these memories. One of the interesting aspects about implanted memories in regards to the other androids is that they typically have a lifespan of about four years in both the novel as well as the book. In that time, many of the androids, like Roy Beatty in particular, have extraordinary experiences in their short life. They see things that you people wouldn't believe. And because of those really powerful experiences, it gives you a little bit of elbow room to imagine that a potential sentience would, under such extreme circumstances, develop an understanding of what it means to be alive and what it means to be um, a thinking, feeling entity that wants to protect its own sovereignty and protect its own life. One of the reasons why I find this really significant as a thought experiment for us socially is because the future is rushing up to humanity extremely fast. Last year in 2019, lots of people had quippy memes on the internet in regards to it being the year that the film Blade Runner took place. And now in 2020, we are in the future that Philip K. Dick imagined with blue skies being blotted out by smoke and smog. And our technologies are also rushing up to that nexus, if, if you will. Chatbots have been around for many years now, and the technology developing artificial intelligence, as well as the bodies and armature and artifice that would encapsulate that artificial intelligence. So it's not just the mind, it's also the body, because the body is the substrate that informs the direct felt experience of an artificial being. One of the things that really struck me when I read the book at 15 was a profound gratitude for the ecosystem and a profound gratitude for the ability to connect with sentience that is not human, that has a different experience, a different body, a different ecosystem and social structure. That perspective is so important for humanity, for its ability to understand itself spiritually, but as well as relate to one another and expand our understanding of what it means to be human in a relative space. How am I different from other creatures? How do they experience reality? How many degrees different is that from how I experience reality? If I can relate to them, can I relate to other people better? Can I expand on what my understanding of empathy is? So we throw the word empathy around a lot but it's important to understand its distinction from something like sympathy. Sympathy is simply feeling sorry for somebody, is simply thinking, oh wow, that's unfortunate, that really sucks. You know, I'm sorry you're going through that. That's, that's a rough go, you know? Whereas empathy is sympathy with identification. So the ability to use the imagination and put yourself in their shoes to sort of feel and experience what's going on in their life through your own understanding but also getting beyond that. There are definitely different degrees of empathy and a lot of that comes from our ability to draw upon our own personal experience or not. So when you're thinking about something like an android and are you able to empathize with an android's experience it's challenging because we don't know the nature of their sentience. We don't know how developed their understanding is or the sophistication of their relationship with their, their sensory body. I want to share with you a short excerpt from a speech that Philip gave a couple years after he wrote Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep. 
1972, a famous speech entitled The Android and the Human. Our environment, and I mean our man-made world of machines, artificial constructs, computers, electronic systems, interlinking homeostatic components, all of this is in fact beginning more and more to possess what the earnest psychologist fear the primitive sees in his environment, animation. In a very real sense, our environment is becoming alive, or at least quasi-alive, and in ways specifically and fundamentally analogous to ourselves. Rather than learning about ourselves by studying our constructs, perhaps we should make the attempt to comprehend what our constructs are up to by looking into what we ourselves are up to. Now, my personal understanding of what this excerpt is referring to is similar to what I was speaking about earlier in terms of empathizing with the machine, empathizing with the android. The android is a result of us trying to understand our own sentience and craft something in our own image. For fear of sounding a little bit demigod-like in that analogy, humanity has an opportunity to understand ourselves better by seeing how we would fashion a reflection of ourselves in the mechanized. I also personally think that there is a large metaphysical lesson here in the fact that we are writing our own reality. We are at the edge of manifesting the science fiction realities that we've written about for the past hundred years or so. With the development of technology at a breakneck pace, it's really important that we're careful about what stories we choose to manifest and choose to bring to life. This might be the part where I get a little emotional. Because after I read Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, I understood that what Philip was writing about wasn't fiction. I felt like he was reaching into some kind of quantum probability and writing about something that was very likely to happen. The names might be different, the circumstances might be different, but the human condition is the same. And in the same kind of petri dish of technology, I saw there was a deep truth that he was writing about. And it scared me. It made me deeply grateful for every blue sky I've seen since then. Not that I wasn't before, but I knew that they might run out someday. I knew that there might be a World War Terminus. I knew that we might see an ecological collapse. Philip K. Dick cared so much about his work that he ate dog food to keep doing it. He lived in Berkeley and he was a poor struggling writer writing essentially science fiction pulp fiction and the man was so broke that he would go to a place in Berkeley that sold hamburgers meant for dogs like for rich people right but the hamburgers were decent enough quality that he was like ah fuck it I'm gonna eat them they're cheap they're decent this man ate dog food he ate little hamburgers meant for dogs he poured his heart out into his work nearly 65 pages a day for years on end twacked out on speed and gutted himself on paper writing novel after novel short story after short story and his work still lives with us today even in things like the Amazon miniseries The Man in the High Castle he wasn't afraid of writing brutal beautiful science fiction extremely gritty tenuous and heartbreaking and I always used to wonder why do I love something so dark and so gritty and so sad and as I've gotten older I realize 
it's because how prophetic it is. And it made me insanely grateful for the world that I still get to witness before a Blade Runner future comes barreling in to our calendars as a reality like it did last year. Ridley Scott did a wonderful job with Blade Runner. There are a few of the themes covered in the book that weren't brought into the film, probably just for the sake of time and attention span on the part of the audience. One of those themes in particular revolves around a character named Mercer. Mercer is a character that's sort of like a televangelist messiah on TV that you never really hear speak any words but you sort of join him on this eternal struggle as he climbs up a hill of what Phil in the book calls Kipple. Kipple's a running theme in Philip's work. It refers to sort of useless matter that was once something but is now discarded and just takes up space. So think of like landfills or, or hoarder trash or just little bits of broken up, discarded everything is basically what Kipple is. And Mercer is almost like uh, Prometheus in a way where he's climbing an eternal hill of Kipple that never really seems to end. And along his ascent, his uh, attempt at transcendence to climb up past the Kipple He's pelted by rocks and kipple by a bunch of unseen people off screen. And in the book, there are these small boxes with handles called empathy boxes. And when you tune into Mercer, you put your hands on the handle of the box and you feel what Mercer feels as he tries to make this ascent up the endless hill of kipple. Now people might think to themselves, why on earth would anybody want to viscerally feel the pain and suffering of Mercer on this journey, on this mission? And in a way, Mercer is almost like a weird pseudo-neo-Christ. Coming from a neutral, spiritual, religious perspective, we could just see Mercer as an analogy for any messiah or any kind of Christ consciousness that's trying to ascend. And so in a way, it's him sharing that subjective experience of trying to transcend. But it also is a way to bring people into the innate human condition of existence as suffering in kind of like a Buddhist way. And because people are living such dreary lives in the future of the book Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, having someone to share their pain and experiences with gives them a sense of community, gives them a sense of um, connection with something outside of themselves. And it makes them feel seen and it also makes them feel like their small daily struggles to fit their respirators and you know that, that their umbrellas and heavy jackets to shield themselves from the elements at least they're not Mercer on the hill but they can feel that sense of perspective by tapping into the empathy box and experiencing what he experiences when Philip K Dick was able to see the film Blade Runner after it was made before it was released in theaters that he got to sit down and watch the whole thing. And when it was over, the first thing he said, this is an anecdote I've come across on the internet, the first thing he said is, can I watch it again? And that's probably a pretty good sign that he really enjoyed it. And it kind of warms my heart to hear that. I feel like every artist who puts so much time and love into their craft rejoices when other people are able to appreciate it on, on that kind of level where they bring it to life. And so in a way, even though Philip passed away shortly after that, he got to see that his work was finally being appreciated on a really deep level that he no doubt 
had hoped for in his own lifetime. And if you haven't seen the movie, do yourself a favor. It's considered long and dark and quiet and very dialogue driven with a couple action scenes, but it's not your typical film. And that's often what kind of prevents people from getting into it. But it is a cult classic for a reason. It is one of the best movies ever created. The scientific community has voted it the best science fiction film ever for good reason. And I happen to be a fan of the new one as well, which I very much like to dive into with you guys at a, a later episode. Um, so do yourself just like one big juicy favor. Go read, do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. Go see Blade Runner, then watch the second Blade Runner. And if you enjoyed that, I also recommend you check out uh, a series of articles that I've written. They're available on my Medium account, uh, as well as on dreamcvr.com. There's a link to the Medium page there. I've written a series of articles about robotics and feminism, uh, which ties into a lot of themes about modern robotics, as well as um, the Pregnant Robots article, which has a lot of stuff drawing upon the newest Blade Runner 2049. So thanks for sitting down with me for a much longer episode regarding Blade Runner. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to the analysis. If you like deep philosophical stuff like this, um, be sure to subscribe, share this with your nerdy friends. Go check out our Patreon and support me there. It's patreon.com slash seraphin. The website is dreamseedvr.com. And um, yeah, be sure to comment and stuff. I love hearing your thoughts. 